Okay, um, just a second. <clears throat> okay, so he died in 1908. Uh, at least he didn't uh, have to go through the misery of the First World War. Ten years later, the great painter Gustav Klim died, and uh, not just him, but also Egon Schiele. You know, in 1918, it was a tragic, uh, tragic year for 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 uh, for uh, well, for many people. Uh, because of the first war and the Spanish, uh, you know, pandemic, and uh, well, it was called Spanish, but it didn't originate in Spain, from what I understood. Uh, it was called the Spanish uh, pandemic because Spain was apparently the first country to make to publicize it, to talk about it. Anyway. So, Josef Maria Olbrich, uh, the, 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 the unique um, author of the secessionist movement, uh, the, of the secessionist building or the secession building in Vienna. This is a proud man, uh, handsome and, uh, you know, almost cocky, uh, but, uh, you know, when the picture was taken, he didn't know that he would die at 41. Unfortunately, the end of life uh, cannot be easily predicted by anyone, so we never know what could happen. That's why I think it's very, very important to live life as intensely as possible, life as intensely as possible, daily and hourly and uh, every minute and every second if possible. I know it's not possible uh, always to be very intense and so on, but yes, Life is could end any time, unfortunately. Um, I mean, who would have thought a successful architect, you know, uh, acknowledged and admired would die at 41? But he did. And Egon Schiele, the great um, uh, artist from about the same time, died at 28. So, Anyway, this is uh, Josef, uh, Josef Maria Olbrich um, with, a, with a, some kind of a tie, I guess. <laughs> but at that time, you know, uh, the people were more uh, reverentious, if I can say so. They, they, they you know, they, they didn't dress as, as these days. Today's you, today, these days you have uh, billionaires dressing with uh, t-shirts and uh, ripped uh, jeans. It was a different time. Anyway, some drawings by him. Um, there is a, I mean, he was a modern architect, uh, no doubt, but there was also uh, the influence of, uh, of, of, of the end of the 19th century, the influence of, uh, even I would say ideologically of the, of the empire. At that time, uh, Vienna was still the capital of an empire. And uh, this created a, a unique culture because you had on one hand aspirations that were modern and uh, you had, uh, you know, a desire for, for a new beginning in a way. But at the same time, uh, you know, uh, the empire was still on for 10 more years. And uh, I mean, from 1908 when he died. And... Uh, you know, Otto Wagner, for example, to whom we'll arrive uh, towards the end of the presentation, was immersed in, 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 in the dual culture, I would say. And I think this is mainly the, the reason, perhaps, why the, the Viennese culture of that time was so interesting, because of its dualities. You know, on one hand, you had a very progressive thinking, and on the other hand, you were part of an empire. So there was the stability of the social and political structure and the instability derived from the longings of the rebellious artists. I mean, you can even see, see here, you, you can see very well. I mean, you know, this is not the facade of a, of a, of a modern building, you know. In fact, it's quite bucolic and pastoral and, uh, you know, almost sickeningly uh, sweet. <laughs> but 
Well, he was young, uh, I imagine, when he did this uh, in 1995, so 13 years before he died. So he was 28 or so. Uh, but but there wasn't just a negative uh, influence of this, you know, uh, transitional period, if I can call it so. Um, there was also something positive, I think, and 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 that's why the culture of Vienna at the time is so interesting because I think of this, this duality that I mentioned. Because you had here, uh, you had simultaneously the Heimat, the fatherland, uh, and, and, and uh, the, 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 the longing, the desire for the avant-garde. And they two, the two contradict each other, of course. And it is the merit of Vienna that this these, uh, these um, rather young uh, architects and architects uh, uh, were able to, not only to function, but, uh, but to even prosper. I mean, to build in the center of Vienna, a building like the secession building, uh, it shows that the city um, didn't throw them in the gutter, quite the opposite. They, they were kind of embraced, although they were rebellious. So this is, you know, the, the elevation of, of, of the building will arrive in detail uh, at, 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 uh, soon, at this building. Uh, but he built other buildings as well, including in Germany. Um, at that time, artists and architects also believed in metaphors, in allegories, in, uh, it was a very special, uh, really, uh, time and I actually think uh, there, there, might, there might be some suggestions for us today because I mean even the magazine that the secession is published which was called Ver Sacrum I mean the very word Sacrum you know which was part of the of the two two words uh, title of the magazine uh, show that uh, you know um, their preoccupations were uh, also had a, a spiritual component, and the critic at that time said that, that uh, you know, when when they declared themselves secessionists, was not so much against the art of the past, but against the commercialization of, of art, and uh, which which was um, uh, risking to lose its um, its uh, you know spiritual core. But you can tell from the combination of words and, and, and drawings, uh, Le Mots et les Images, if I am to use the formulation of René Magritte, uh, this is a, you know, a, a form of illustration that is still anchored in the past, uh, in tradition. Uh, it could be maybe for some uh, a little bit uh, too sweet, but Again, we are dealing with very creative people here who assume the tradition but also betrayed it. Secession. And I, yesterday, talking with the people who participated here on the Zoom meeting yesterday, I said, why not start ourselves a secessionist movement? And it could be an international secession or a or a sum of, uh, you know, smaller secessions, you know, a, a, a secession in uh, Stockholm, a secession in Bucharest, a secession in Ahmedabad, because I, I, I think the, the reverberations of the Viennese, and in fact, it was preceded by the, the uh, German, uh, German secession about 10 years earlier in München, um, it's a phenomenon that could happen any time and any place. Uh, these are studies for um, you know candle holders, and he also he was also a designer, and we'll, we'll look at his work more in detail. The secession building. So from 1898. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, a year or two ago, when I went to students from the university here to Vienna, uh, I found a book. I like I like flea markets, so I found a book 
from 1887 or 1885 that attracted my attention and I bought it and uh, and uh, not before I I, uh, <laughs> I I bargained for it and it, anyway it was a good deal I, I bought it and um, it had it had images drawings and engravings and uh, uh, of, uh, of allegories in fact it was called emblems and allegories translated into English but why am I mentioning this book because Later on, I found out that this was the first book in 1885 or 1887 published by an engraver in Vienna where he invited his friends and between his friends there, there were people like uh, Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele and uh, Koloman Moser and you know the, the stars of the, of the secessionist movement and uh, Jugendstil uh, to contribute with an artwork. And that the same publisher and engraver in 1898, so exactly this year, published a second edition of that book where the same artists began to be a little bit more modern. And that, that book uh, is immensely, immensely expensive now. I mean, just one page, one page, I, I, saw, I saw it on eBay, it sells for several thousand euros. Uh, because it is the manifesto of a rebirth of the Viennese culture and the, uh, a modern, uh, a modern uh, first gesture. And the publisher of that book is considered the Führer, the father of the, of the, of the modernism in, uh, in Vienna. Anyway, uh, this is like a, a small intermezzo. Um, this is the building. And it is a glorious building, and anyone who goes to Vienna uh, probably uh, can't uh, can't uh, avoid it. Uh, and uh, it, it is the temple of arts. That's what it is, and uh, and um, it is as uh, appealing today as it was uh, 100 um, more than 120 years ago. They still have secession, the secessionist movement still exists or the secessionist organization still exists today and they still organize exhibitions. They are actually located in this building. But I think something is, was a little bit weakened because the, 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 the opposition to the establishment that the first artists and architects associated with the secessionist movement uh, had today perhaps is um, diluted, although there are, there is rebellion today as well. And it's enough to mention, for example, the, the, the outrageous artist Hermann Nietzsche, about whom I can talk a little bit later, maybe. Anyway, here you see the inscription of the building, which was the credo of the, of, 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 of the secession, uh, secessionist artists and architects in translation to every age its art and to every art its freedom this i think should be written in every city of the world uh, in some places because i think it's very refreshing and encouraging to know that that something like this was written once and uh, something like this could be written again and could be believed in again, you know, because I think art has to express the truth of its time. And in order to do it, sometimes it has to fight with conventions, with, um, uh, you know, uh, the narrowness of views of many people, uh, society in general, politicians, commercial interests, so he needs his freedom, but in order to get that freedom, you, know, you have to fight for it. And this is, this is what they did then in um, 1898. And this is what we should do too in 2020. That is if we love art and if we love the truth uh, that art is supposed to, to whisper or to murmur. Anyway, uh, it is amazing in a way that these avant-gardists had a means to, to actually build uh, in the center of Vienna uh, this uh, temple of art. 
it means they were well connected and they had uh, the, the means. Uh, of course, they had some very successful uh, people there, uh, in between them, like Otto Wagner, a much celebrated Viennese architect, or Gustav Klimt, equally celebrated uh, great painter. Um, Last year or two years ago, again, when I went to Vienna, I, I, I was not with the students, but I, I was near this building and I laid on the grass just to rest. And the policeman came to me and said, sir, uh, do you feel well? I said, yes, I feel well, thank you. He said, no, no, I, it's fine. You can, you, you can rest on the grass. Just uh, I was worried that maybe you don't feel well. So, you know, a very polite uh, and kind uh, policeman. <laughs> giving me no troubles uh, in the shadow of this building, you know, I, uh, so they, they're open-minded, you know, they, uh, it's a democratic society, but, but the, the lights and the shadows of the, of the, of the, of the, of the empire somehow can still be seen or felt. Anyway, Ornaments, you know, ornaments that uh, another Viennese, uh, well, by adoption, Adolf Loss fought against. But as you can see, um, ornaments are very present on this building and they were also present uh, on, on, on many other buildings and are still present on many other buildings in Vienna. So uh, this year, there are 150 years since the birth of Adolf Loss. And I, I launched a competition uh, for a new ornament, towards a new ornament, polemically, um, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis him. I, I admire Adolf Loss, but I think in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, ornaments, uh, his ideas are debatable, to, to say the least. I even thought of writing uh, an essay, uh, paraphrasing his title instead of ornament and crime, to be called structure and crime, because I think uh, an excessive uh, structuralist could be as uh, murderous as uh, an excessive uh, ornamentation. Anyway, um, by the way of, uh, of the secession building, maybe you know there is a great frieze here by, by Gustav Klim dedicated to Beethoven. And, and, and this year there are 250 years since the birth of Ludwig van Beethoven. And I wrote already the text for a house for Ludwig van Beethoven for a competition. I think, I, it is my belief, we need badly idealism because we cannot function only at the level of, 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 of prosaic interests. And I think this pandemic, which is forces us to spend more time at home, could also uh, um, you know, be uh, uh, some kind of an encouragement, an oblique encouragement to to have time for activities which otherwise we would we would have had no time for, and um, so I, I I plan to launch this a house for Ludwig van Beethoven and towards a new ornament, because I think, you know, if Gustav Klimt celebrated uh, Beethoven in uh, in this uh, through his great artwork within this building, why can't an architect also pay homage to a great and one of the greatest composers in terms of architecture. What could be more exciting than, than to try to imagine a house for Beethoven, you know, to express the spirit of his music, the tumultuous energy, the, 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 his complexity, you know. Uh, yes, you could say it's a futile exercise, but I don't think so. Because, because by, by trying to do a house for Beethoven, you investigate other, other dimensions of reality and the, of life. And when you'll have maybe the, and hopefully the occasion to build a real building, maybe some, some of those studies will come back to you and uh, will, will nourish your, um, your creation. Anyway, but all in all, I agree with uh, Stephen Hall when he was asked uh, what do you recommend uh, young architects and students? And he was very clear. He said, remain idealistic. The soul needs the ideal more than the real. But how very often we forget this, unfortunately. All too often, you know, because we neglect our own soul. 
You know, who talks about idealists these days? Almost nobody, really. He was an exception, and maybe there are a few other people, but in general, we don't even uh, whisper the word uh, idealism, and we do not whisper the word soul, as if it doesn't exist. Anyway, back to the secessionists uh, and to Olbrich, um, Josef Maria Olbrich. The plan is perfectly symmetrical. So you see, you can be modern, but also work within symmetry. There's nothing wrong with symmetry and, uh, and being modern at the same time. Although there are dogmas, uh, some schools uh, thought in architecture uh, reject uh, by definition uh, symmetry, but uh, I think they are wrong. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, e even this kind of uh, uh, illustration, you know, where you combine, you know, a human silhouette with a certain kind of uh, graphics, you know, lettering, and the plan of a building. It shows that at that time there was still some kind of a quest for wholeness. So there was the, the meeting between graphics, illustrations, um, paintings, um, uh, uh, engravings, uh, architecture, and so on. I, I, I think we need again something like this. And I don't know why projects in architecture today, most of the time, they reject this kind of illustration. We are, we are very dry, I would say, uh, most of the time. There are exceptions, of course, as well. Plus, there is symbolism. In this building, there is symbolism. That very symbolism that Kendo Tange claimed that is very, very important to architecture, but is very, very rarely uh, used or addressed in today's architecture, because we very rarely think in symbolic terms. Uh, and uh, I think we deprive architecture of a very important uh, dimension. And then there is the gold, but this is not the vulgar old uh, gold, it's the, it's the psychological one. You know, uh, I, I keep uh, reminding myself, I don't know Latin, but I, I, I memorized a phrase from uh, the book by Carl Jung, Psychology and Alchemy, which is like this, aurum vos, nostrum non est aurum vulgi, which means our gold is not the vulgar one. And and if it's not the vulgar one, meaning money, what kind of gold is it? Well, it's the gold of spirit, it's the gold of the soul, it's the gold of idealism. Uh, it's, it's a spiritual uh, gold. And I think that gold we need again. And the flowers, of course. Who dare today to draw flowers on, 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 a, on a column or the corner of the, or the elevation of a building? Uh, not too many people, because it would be considered uh, naive uh, or, uh, I don't know, anachronistic. But it's not just the flower and it's not just gold. There are also animals uh, uh, present here and even uh, figures of, uh, you know, uh, inner terror in a way. Because, because uh, these Viennese artists and architects, they, they uh, understood life in its complexity. So uh, there was a, a, a mixture between, uh, you know, the lightness of life and the darkness of life. I mean, you can see the, the snakes of Medusa. Now uh, you see, uh, th that's why the building is still relevant, because it tells a truth that is... Uh, uh, beyond the, the time when it was built. And, and the immersion in myth, in mythology, who is doing what architect today works in some kind of a conjunction with a myth of its culture, of his culture, or uh, his, uh, yeah, the specific myth uh, or mythology of his or her culture. I don't know of any really, uh, you know, and so that's because we deprived architecture at its spiritual core. That's why. And the, and the, and the loss is immense. 
Now, a house, an early house uh, built by him. Uh, this is also interesting, you know, you, you can tell uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, this is, this is not the southern part of Europe, it's uh, rather the central Europe, uh, towards the east a little bit, the Germanic. Uh, um, it's uh, as you can still elements, but uh, yes, you know, again, you have narration, you know, it's a narrative architecture there is a there is some kind of a narration there you know at the top maybe related to the the client the biography of the client or the i don't know the the function of the building again if we do something like this today we would be considered uh, totally anachronistic and inadequate but uh, i think we we we, we impoverished architecture very very much by divorcing it from narration. We also divorce ourselves from the, from the other artists, you know. We do not collaborate any longer with a painter, with a sculptor and so on. You know, the poor painter and the poor sculptor or the poor engraver, they die of hunger in an attic or in the basement of a building, having no way to contribute to, to, the, to uh, the, uh, that synthesis that was meant to be the building. And our buildings die of uh, boredom in a way, and we die of boredom because we do not collaborate with, uh, with our relatives, that is with the painter, the sculptor, and, and the other artists, said. And by doing so, we also betray the, 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 the call to arms of Walter Gropius, uh, you know, one of the forefathers of modernism, who claimed that the artists should work together for the, for the building. Why don't we do that? Why? Uh, in this case, you obviously have the presence of the craftsman and of the artist and of the architect simultaneously. Another house from 1901. You can see his architectural language is, uh, is uh, diverse. He's, he, he was a versatile architect and very young. Now the entrance into the building is an event. That door is a special door because it's the entrance into the building. It cannot just be a rectangle in, in a, you know, a rectang rectangular hole in a white wall. It has to be different because it's, it's, it's the transition between the outside and the inside, and it has to be an event. And it is an event for him in this building. I'm sure, uh, you know, the other doors are not like this, but that is a special door. Another house, this one in Darmstadt, 1901. Again, you see the, the entrance door is, uh, is, uh, is communicating the event that is supposed to be. Uh, most of the many times these days, we enter into the building through the parking lot the, the, or parking garage underneath the building. You know, uh, an access without glory, without humanism, without sensitivity. You know, yes, functional because from your car you you take the elevator or whatever. But but that event that such an entrance into the building uh, meant is missing. In, uh, in many of the buildings of today. I mean, here, the, the, just the door itself is, is, uh, is a creation, as you can see. Another villa, this one from 1898, uh, the very year when he built uh, uh, the secessionist building uh, in, uh, in Vienna. Again, you see, uh, uh, they were not uh, hesitant to, to, to use uh, pictorial uh, representations or illustrations on their facades. And uh, I wonder why we cannot do that again. Would it be because we would, would be considered unacceptably naive or, or, or inadequate or anachronistic?
Now, the house Olbrich, his own house in Darmstadt, where there was a, a colony of artists. Uh, his house, his own house is more cubistic, uh, but, but it, it, it employs ornaments as well. Um, I wonder if he lived at least 20 years more, what, were, what, what uh, other buildings he might have produced. You know, it, it is sad when, when such a creative force is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, destined to, to live uh, not sufficiently. But what can we do? Fate is, um, has uh, the upper hand. Uh, this is a, a complex of buildings in, uh, in Darmstadt. Uh, he moved actually to Darmstadt and uh, he designed this uh, ample complex uh, and uh, is present in uh, many, if, if not most, histories of modern architecture. So he was able to handle also small buildings and larger buildings, I would say rather convincingly. Again, we are dealing with an architect who was less than 40. As I said yesterday, Louis Kahn almost started at 55. I mean, that's when he, he, he became famous with a um, Jewish bath, a public bath in Trenton and uh, Richard's laboratories in Philadelphia. He built uh, some housing complexes before, but in a hesitant uh, kind of modernism. So, although it is said that there is no um, uh, precocity in, in, in architecture. Uh, here you have an example of a young architect who, who built significantly before he was 40. This is a Russian Orthodox church uh, in, in, in front of the complex. And I don't know what it is here, um, uh, maybe connected with the church, I don't know, but uh, it, it does look like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, something that invites one's curiosity to explore it. I, 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 I keep reiterating that you know, if we could somehow bring back sculpture and, and, and painting uh, to our buildings, it would be a, a benefit for many. What kind of sculpture and what kind of painting, that remains to be, uh, to be seen. You know, it could be abstract, it could be, but it's important, I think, the collaboration with the artist. And not just with the artist, with a philosopher, with a poet, with a theologian, with a physicist, with a, yeah, I think uh, it's a high time for uh, multidisciplinarity these days. We can learn from each other a lot. Okay, some furniture designed by uh, Josef Maria Olbrich. Uh, he was a good designer, uh, and he was not the only one. You also see, you, you will see after uh, after uh, this uh, small presentation, uh, the one on Josef Hoffman. He was also a great designer. These architects, they, 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 there were no frontiers between uh, building a building and building a chair or building a table or, uh, you know, designing uh, forks and knives or whatever. They designed everything. And I think, uh, although schools uh, in general separate various uh, fields, but I think they do it because of uh, bureaucratic reasons. Because in essence, a good architect can be a great urbanist and can be a, a great designer, an object designer. And uh, many architects, as you know, designed uh, glorious chairs and not just chairs. And I think Miss van der Rohe was correct when he said that uh, at least sometimes uh, to design a skyscraper is easier than to design a chair. 
it's very, very difficult to design a good chair and it's a very good exercise. So I, 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 I suggest to any, any student of architecture or architect to try to design a chair. It's even therapeutic because uh, a chair is like, a, you know, uh, almost a self-portrait in, uh, in terms of design. But as you can see, all brick designed, not just chairs, but everything. You know, and, and, and you know, these are, uh, you know, expensive pieces now, and maybe they were expensive pieces at that time as well. You know, designed by a skillful designer with good materials and great craftsmanship. And look how different these two chairs are from each other. Tomorrow, God willing, I will talk about Eileen Gray, and Eileen Gray, uh, you know, designed herself uh, pieces of furniture, and one of them was bought by Yves Saint Laurent with 20 million uh, euros, if you can believe it. I think it was a chair. 20 million euros is uh, insane. Some, uh, you know, this is jewelry. So uh, <laughs> he did jewelry too. Why not? Zaha Hadid did jewelry too. Somebody told me that uh, she had a Zaha Hadid had. I don't know if that's still the case now, but when she was alive, she had a department in her office, which employed uh, more than four hundred people. She had a department that worked just for uh, fashion. So when she wanted to go to a party, uh, she designed a new pair of shoes for herself or a, a new bag. And she would go to this department and tell them, please produce the drawings and then produce the objects. And they did. Anyway, Olbrich, uh, you know, 100 uh, so years earlier, designed himself jewelry and we'll see also Josef Hoffman. I actually think that this sens sensualization of design and architecture is a positive thing. And because it brings back the pleasure principle and the playfulness so very associated with creativity. So I think if we become a little more flexible and, uh, you know, for example, why not have a, you know, uh, you know, someone who is doing his diploma in architecture let's say, uh, design uh, the house of jewelry and also design some jewels and or design, um, you know, a museum for, uh, for, uh, for furniture and also design a chair, at least a chair. Why, why shouldn't the architect also show, uh, you know, openness to other fields which are also connected with uh, the very essence of, uh, you know, uh, his, his profession? things connect. Anyway, he designed a lot of things. Uh, of course, in, in modern times, or in almost contemporary times, you had many architects who did this. Aldo Rossi did it, Michael Graves did it, uh, uh, <laughs> ad nauseum, you know, because uh, in a way, you know, there are risks here, like in the case of Michael Graves to, to get carried away by the pleasure principle, by hedonistic impulses, and then uh, lose all the serious uh, connection with the essence of architecture or even design. But these, uh, these people, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, I think they, they, they were still anchored in the traditions of the 19th century. And uh, the, the, there was also the craftsmanship that served them well. And those craftsmen these days uh, are, uh, very, very rarely can be found. Anyway, um, we end now the presentation on uh, Josef Maria Olbrich. And uh, if you allow me, I'll begin the one on Josef Hoffman, who was also a founding member of the secessionist movement. 
and an important one. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, by the way, of Ulbricht, we'll also talk about Hoffman. And at the end, if we still have a little bit of time, I will talk about Otto Wagner. Okay, so Hoffman lived longer. Uh, he died at 86. And uh, as I said, he was considered, I don't know very well why, but he was considered the first star architect. You see, the first star architect. Um, although he is now a little bit less talked about, uh, with the exception of those of, of, of the, you know, the experts. Uh, this is the mustache of a successful man, no doubt. But at that time, many men uh, sported such uh, mustaches. Um, also, what I want to say, because when we arrive at Otto Wagner, and uh, I think I have some images, or at least an image with his office, the big, 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 huge difference between that time and our time is that at that time there were no women, there were only men, with mustaches or without mustaches, you know, but only men. Uh, and uh, and uh, now um, the landscape is, uh, is uh, completely different. You know, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, female students and female architects and they are asserting themselves. And I think it's a good thing. I, I actually think, uh, uh, you know, uh, men try their best to, to destroy the world. And now it's the turn of women to maybe uh, turn things around uh, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, not follow on the path of their predecessors. Okay, so this is uh, the first star architect, and he <laughs> he does look like a man who knows what he's doing, um, I guess. Um, anyway, the sunlight enters now my room aggressively, and it, it blinds me, And uh, but I see now the word drawings, so I'm going to show you some drawings by the first star architect. Very playful uh, little drawings and, of course, very ornamental in nature. In fact, that's what they are, ornaments. Those very ornaments that Adolf Loss fought against with all his vigor. And they lived in the same place, can you believe it? And at the same time. But then Adolf Loss himself was, uh, I'm not saying he was hypocritical, but while he rejected ornamentation, he used very rich uh, natural organic materials like marbles, which had a built-in ornamentation. So uh, they can be seen in his buildings today. So, uh, you know, on the other hand, all his uh, tumultuous, um, you know, uh, assault on, uh, on graffitis and, and uh, tab tattoos, uh, again, is, 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 uh, is uh, irrelevant in the context where in Vienna there are many tattoo shops and also graffitis in some uh, subway stations and so on. So the so-called criminal ornamentation or, or uh, uh, criminal, crimi, crimi, criminal tendencies of, of human beings uh, relating to ornaments, as his theory was, uh, continue undisturbed. Anyway, um, my theory is actually that the more ornaments we'll have in the world, the less crime we'll have, because uh, again, based on his theory, the, the ornament is some kind of a, um, you know, uh, sublimated. Uh, um, you know, uh, crime tendency. So if, if, you, if you express those tendencies through ornaments, you will not have the desire to pick up the knife or the rifle or whatever any longer. While bare walls could exasperate one and, and they certainly exasperate the graffiti artist who in despair covers them, you know, as, as, as he covers sometimes trains and uh, industrial buildings or whatever. It's, uh, I think uh, where you have many graffitis, those graffitis express the, 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 the anger even of uh, 
mostly young people who have no way to express the, the you know, inner energies otherwise. So they do it through graffitis or through tattoos. Anyway, interesting drawings by uh, Joseph Hoffman. Uh, well, Hoffman is J-O-S-E-F and Olbrich was J uh, o S E P H. He designed also the the pavilion of Austria, the Venice Biennial, uh, which still exists. Uh, and I think one of the drawings earlier was about that a study for that uh, pavilion. He designed everything: rugs, um, you know, textiles, uh, uh, cutlery, uh, everything even buildings. But look at his drawing, seems so uh, naive, you know, but, uh, but he was the first star architect. Now, uh, of course, his time, his birthday with celebration will come uh, sooner or later, and we'll talk ab again about Hoffman. But I thought today, by the way, of Olbrich might be interesting to, to take a look at his works too. Villa Spitzer in Austria from 1902. So at that time, uh, uh, Olbrich uh, was um, you know, 30 something, maybe 34 or 35 years old. Um, I mean, you know, I keep saying if you have, it doesn't matter how the building is, but if you have ivy, we can we, with ivy, you can you can save any building. It doesn't matter how unresolved the facades are. That's why jokingly, but not totally jokingly, I keep telling the students, if the facade doesn't work out or something is wrong with uh, the way your building looks like, just uh, generate some uh, ivy on the, on the building and I, the ivy will take care of the building just fine. I didn't yet see an ugly building covered by ivy. No because ivy is nature and it's green and it's even when the even if when it's not green like here you see at the top is it's not yet green but but those uh, arabesques on the facade create an, an ornamentation that uh, you know, I, I think is at least interesting Now, uh, related to uh, Josef uh, Hoffman uh, is that story, uh, and I don't know because I also read it uh, that it is connected with other architects, but the original one I think is connected with Hoffman uh, that uh, one day uh, he visited the building he designed where he designed everything, including the sleepers of the client. And uh, unfortunately, the client committed the crime of wearing another pair of slippers, and the architect got completely mad. And so he he <laughs> he screamed at the, the client, you know, this is unacceptable. How dare you wear a different pair of slippers when I designed I designed a specific kind of slippers that go well with the building. These are these are the the maddening excesses of the of the um, egotistical architect. Anyway, um, houses, houses, houses. Another one, Villa Henneberg. Uh, you know, you could say yes, it's a, it's a traditional or traditional traditionalist building. Uh, yes, I guess it is, but. Inside a different world, very different world. Uh, in fact, so different that I don't believe it's from the same building. I mean, if you'd build something like this today, I, 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 I think you wouldn't be too ashamed of yourself. Uh, he built a lot. Um, I saw only two buildings by him, and one of them you are going to see very soon. It's uh, at the edge of Vienna. Uh, it's still part of Vienna, but a little bit further than Schönbrunn. Um, 
He designed also a hospital in Vienna. Now this building is more stern, uh, I confess, but uh, you know, inside again, there is a richness which is typical to Hoffman. This one, this one I saw and is a very opulent and uh, rich building. Uh, we couldn't get in, I was with some students, but we photographed it from across the street because it was a little bit higher, that sidewalk on the other side. So we were able to see this. Uh, it, it's it's more than a villa, it's almost like a small palace, if I can if I can call it so. Probably for a, for a rich doctor or a, a rich lawyer or uh, you know someone who who could afford uh, such a house, and it's kept very very well. And if you are in Vienna, you can arrive easily at it um, by uh, tram car. Inside also is, uh, you know, impressive. Now this is the, the sanatorium, uh, uh, also in Vienna, 1904-1905. Uh, and you can see inside is a, is a kind of a luxurious sanatorium, I mean, uh, <laughs> First of all, you have a high-ranking, uh, you know, uh, architect uh, designing it, and he designed everything: the furniture, the pavement, uh, everything, the lamps. Otherwise, outside the building is rather, you know, stern. I mean, e e even the, you know, the patient's uh, room is, is, is not too bad. Unfortunately, the photograph has some problems, but... Now you would say, why did he use this uh, um, ornamental uh, design around uh, the windows, you know? Why didn't he leave them in peace? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I could ask many questions about the human body, all kinds of, you know, so-called accidents that uh, nature created uh, or God created uh, that uh, you, cannot, you cannot explain everything in terms of you know, explicit, um, you know, function. You can tell it's the same designer, the same architect, the, the same uh, uh, creative force that made the building, also made the furniture. And uh, yeah, it, it's a pleasant uh, hallway, you know, it's uh, maybe, you know, if a hospital looked like this or a sanatorium, uh, one would not be so afraid to go to hospitals. But if you go these days to uh, an emergency room, as I had to go myself, you know, it is, you know, I mean, uh, they are not spaces for contemplation or for, be, for being, uh, you know, uh, in touch with a certain degree of beauty. And I think this could have a, a negative effect also on the health of the patients. Why not bring beauty uh, in a hospital? Yeah, paintings and, uh, you know, flowers and have some good music or I don't know. I think it's important. I look at the, the room where they ate, you know, the... the it's almost like a luxurious restaurant. Look at it. Anyway, it's Vienna, the imperial city. Now, another famous work by him, truly famous, and uh, is present in almost all histories of modern architecture, if not all of them, 
Palais Stoclet in Bruxelles, in Belgium, from 1905-1911. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very important work, maybe his most important architectural work. And it still exists, and it's complex, and it's, uh, it's both simple and complex. It's both modern and at the same time kind of uh, connected with what preceded it. Um, Belgium. Belgium had itself, uh, you know, very important uh, Art Nouveau uh, architects. We see some kind of, I imagine, reproductions of Gustav Klimt on the wall, on the walls, the two uh, long walls. But at that time, Architects and artists still, still longed for, for uh, you know, the total work of art. And uh, such dreams we don't have any longer. And uh, I think that's a problem. Must be pleasant, you know, to have the to have the chance to design everything, you know, the building, the, the ornaments, the furniture, even the landscape of the garden. Now the Austria Pavilion uh, at the Venice Biennial from 1934, which still exists, and it's not a bad building. Uh, again, perfectly symmetrical. The, the only asymmetry is the word Austria in the lower right corner. And I, I keep telling uh, like a short story about Adao Ando that I saw uh, an exhibition by him in uh, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York where he had a little sketch on a very long wall, like 15 meters long or something like this. And in the middle, he did a sketch, uh, you know, like around 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters, you know, the, the typical Tadawando sketch, like with a circle and the cross. And he signed it twice. It was signed in the lower uh, right corner and in the lower left corner of the wall. And that was the retrospective of Tadawando. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody knew that was his exhibition. Even if you didn't know the specifics of his way of sketching, and why I ask myself, why would he sign twice? You know, a rather not an exceptional sketch on a wall. It was, if it was on a book or a notebook or whatever, you would say that no note, notebooks might have disappeared, but the wall would not have disappeared. And I, I also ask myself, how come that? Uh, um, an important contemporary architect signed, uh, you know, an unimpressive really, and nothing so special about that sketch twice on a wall, while the Chartres Cathedral is not signed. And we are talking about, uh, you know, one of the greatest achievements in architecture where there, there was no signature because people were for the glory of God and they were anonymous. And here you have an individual, uh, highly respected and highly known, and he deserves, uh, he deserved the admiration and the respect, but he signed his sketch twice. And I asked myself, what was the reason for signing it in the first place, once, why twice? So you see two different times, two different ages. One, when people erected unbelievable buildings like the Chartres Cathedral, and no one would have thought of signing anything. One single sculpture that adorns Chartres Cathedral 
is infinitely superior to the sketch drawn by Tadawando on that wall. And while he signed it twice, the sculptor at Chartres didn't even think of signing it. So you see how, how we changed. Anyway, uh, so back to, to Venice, the Venice Biennial and the building by uh, Josef, uh, Josef Hoffman. This is a, um, a picture from, from the time when it was built before the uh, Second World War. And this is the plan. Now, the gravestone uh, of Gustav Mahler, and uh, that time uh, architects designed also for death. Very rarely this is happening these days, but then it happened. So, uh, uh, um, you know, this is the, you know, the graveyard of, uh, the grave of, of, of a great composer. Great composer who had a great wife, maybe even greater than him. I know, sorry for the cynicism, but maybe you know, Alma Mahler, who was his wife, was also the wife of Walter Gropius and the lover of Oskar Kokoschka, if not his wife as well. That this woman must have been remarkable if she's, you know, uh, if three remarkable men fell in love with her, with the same woman. Walter Gropius, Gustav Mahler, and Oskar Kokoschka. And I think even, uh, uh, no, no, I think I'm wrong about uh, the fourth one. But I think there was another famous fourth one that I, whose name I do not remember. Anyway, she must have been a remarkable, uh, remarkable woman. His own grave, uh, a stone. I almost felt like saying excellent, but how could you use the word excellent when you describe a, a gravestone? But I think it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, its symbolism is, uh, is clear uh, and it's simple and it's uh, evocative. Uh, and so uh, I think he had a good taste in designing his own um, gravestone. Maybe it doesn't show the greatest modesty, but, but then if it's true what I read that uh, Carlos Scarpa is actually buried at the, uh, the, uh, the Brion Cemetery vertically somewhere in a, in a wall, although I didn't find confirmation of this uh, strange uh, information. Um, anyway, architects are sometimes uh, a little bit strange and even the way Carlos Scarpa died, uh, you know, apparently he died falling from the uh, terrace uh, of a building in Japan with seven floors and other other rumors were that he died he died in Japan that's for sure but he either died falling from the stair uh, that was bringing him down from the plane or inside the building falling again on the but I think that 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 initial uh, information that I read that he fell from the top of the building although I don't know what he was doing there you know, a 72 years old uh, man on top of a Japanese building. Anyway, yes, architects, uh, but, but uh, from what uh, I was told, uh, Carlos Scarpa used to drink a lot. So just like Alvar Aalto. Um, anyway, Gustav Klimt's grave. He designed also the grave of Gustav Klimt. Uh, this one more uh, modest, uh, you know, uh, Modest, modest, but there are fresh flowers near it, and this is very nice. And he was, he deserves them because he was a great painter. Some design by uh, Josef Hoffman. Ag again, as I said, he designed everything. Um, in fact, more than everything, if there is something like this, more than everything. This could be an interesting possible title for, uh, for, uh, for uh, some kind of writing, more than everything. Uh, famous chair, it seems comfortable, it seems, uh, you know, no more, no, no less. No, no, he is very convincing as a designer, no doubt.
Well, this reminds me a little bit of uh, Le Corbusier, but uh, as you know, maybe uh, Le Corbusier, his furniture was not apparently always designed by him, but by Charlotte Perion, who worked with him, another woman who was um, kind of, uh, you know, in the shadow of, 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 of the master. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, there are injustices in, 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 in this field. That uh, important, uh, you know, creators are uh, kept in the shadow by the mechanisms of culture or misogynism or I don't know what. Oh, brochure! This is in Romanian. I don't know. A jewelry, uh, a piece of jewelry. Um, larger than it is uh, you know, in reality, but nice. The work of, uh, of God or of nature, the stone with its own uh, built-in ornaments and then the ornamental work of, of, of the mortal, meaning in this case, Josef Hoffman. Okay, thank you. And now if you still have a desire to spend a little more time with me, I can show you Otto Wagner. And then we can say that we dedicated uh, uh, some time to uh, uh, this trio of uh, Austrian architects that are, were formidable. And um, hopefully they will inspire us um, in uh, even in unexpected ways. So he died at uh, 76, but in the same year, that fatidical year, when, when, uh, when Gustav Klimt died and when Egon Schiele died. All three died in 1918. Now, he was a proud man and he had reasons to be proud. And he was dressed like a proud man, a confident man. Um, He, in many ways, he, his impact on Vienna was, was, was immense, not just as an architect, but also an, as an urbanist. And unfortunately, I don't have in this presentation uh, references to his urban, uh, urbanist uh, work uh, or work in urbanism, but I, I suggest to you who is interested to, 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 to search for, for materials because he, he was uh, very interesting and, and devoted and prolific and, and creative uh, urbanist. Um, I like this picture of him. This is a man who, you know, uh, if I can say so, he, he, he arrived at verticality by living creatively and succeeding. Drawings. He drew incessantly and also uh, he was a great teacher. And so there were, I mean, Olbrich, the builder, the architect of the secession uh, building uh, was, was his student. And he had other important students, not to mention those who collaborated in building Red Vienna, that great, uh, um, you know, social movement in Vienna in the 30s when they built incredible uh, large uh, housing complexes for those in need, a very noble uh, uh, Viennese activity. There were many of them, the pupils of Otto Wagner. Otto Wagner, who uh, he had uh, sympathy for, uh, um, for the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but as a complex man, an artist, he also had uh, empathy and sympathy and affection. Uh, he cared for those uh, less privileged. He designed, for example, a subway station for uh, specifically for the emperor. And apparently the emperor only, only used the train twice to arrive there. It was across the street from Schönbrunn. But he, it was his dream that he would uh, convince the emperor of the virtues of modernism. Uh, his uh, his uh, drawings are uh, very, very well done. 
maybe some of his students uh, help him. This is the church that we are going to see uh, later on. Uh, I, I, I like Wagner exactly because he was uh, with one foot, so to speak, in uh, in uh, in the, the you know in the mentality generated uh, by by uh, living in an empire, and then with the other announcing the new world and the new beginning and modernity. He built uh, his first building actually was this synagogue in Budap Budapest from 1873. Not a bad building at all. It was neglect neglected for a number of years, but uh, uh, they refurbished it and it looks great. I mean, if he built just this building and, you know, you would have said he didn't lose his uh, time on this earth. Uh, he built much more than this. By the way, of a synagogue, maybe you know Frank Lloyd Wright, he made once in his uh, infinite modesty a sketch for a cathedral for one million people in New York City. Can you imagine a cathedral meaning a Christian building, but for one million people in New York City. Of course, it was not built, but based on that sketch, he did build a synagogue, much smaller, of course, but very similar to the design made for the cathedral. So it's kind of interesting now that the cathedral became a synagogue. Sorry for the writing in French, it's a habitation, it's a building, uh, housing, uh, a block of flats uh, in, in Vienna, one of his earliest, because he built several. A rich building, you know, I mean, you look at the texture of the, of the walls and uh, the facade is, uh, is uh, it has substance, even the, the uh, by dim dimensionality of the facade. Another one, uh, this one, uh, you know, more stern. Um, there are many such buildings in, in Vienna, rather white or whitish. Not all of them very impressive, but very well kept. Another one. He built a lot, a lot of uh, uh, blocks of flats. He also built an Ullerag uh, there soon, uh, you know, a lot of uh, subway, subway stations because he was in charge with the subway system, I mean, ar architecturally speaking. A uh, bank uh, inserted be between two blocks of flats. His first house, this is the Wagner house. He built two houses for himself. This is the first one he built. Kind of inspired, I would say, by Schinkel with some kind of uh, 19th century romanticism. When was it built? 1886, yeah. Um, It's obvious he was doing well for himself <laughs> by doing well for other people, I guess. Anyway, um, 
another one, another building, you know, uh, housing uh, unit uh, or complex, maybe not so special, but, but much more uh, austere and uh, you could say almost modern, although there are still ornaments adorning uh, the spaces between the windows. He didn't renounce his elite ornaments, uh, so in that sense, Adolf Loos was um, more revolutionary. This one is a little bit hard to see because of the urban context. You can tell that in the case of Otto Wagner, uh, uh, the presence of the emperor and of the empire, uh, the Austro-Hungarian empire, was still felt. He had modern longings and he, he was part of the secessionist movement, but he also, you know, he was a little older than the others. And uh, I think he, uh, that was a part of him. That's why I, I compare him a little bit, although maybe from a certain point of view, the, the comparison is uh, inappropriate with Salvador Dali, because Salvador Dali declared that he was both an anarchist and a monarchist. And in a way, Wagner was also a monarchist and an anarchist. If by monarchist we mean someone who had uh, you know, respect and even reverence for the emperor, and an anarchist because he was uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, almost, almost an avant-garde uh, architect or artist. Now this is a, a bridge, uh, a bridge, but uh, but but it's not just uh, engineering here; it's also architecture, and you'll see in details. It's actually called the Bridge of the Lion, and you can see the lions uh, guarding the the bridge, and you can see very very nice uh, you know details. Why shouldn't we bring, you know, at least from time to time, the lion back to the art of building? Because the lion, as long as he's not, uh, you know, uh, alive and running after us, is, is a symbol of uh, optimism and, and, and power and so on. Uh, So designed every he designed everything. Maybe he didn't design cutlery and uh, you know uh, little objects like Joseph Hoffman. That but that's because he was busy you know uh, designing uh, all the subway stations almost in Vienna, and uh, you saw many apartment buildings and uh, other buildings as well. Will uh, will arrive at them. But great still work here and again the presence of the human figure and uh, some kind of figuration and narration is nice. Another, uh, this one I don't even have find, find pictures. He also designed for Gustav Mahler a building. It's called, uh, or, or I don't know if it was designed for him, but Gustav Mahler lived there in this building. Uh, I apologize, I, I'm not sure. It's possible that he designed it for, for Mahler, but I, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, Mahler was doing well. Uh, you know, I mean, how many composers live uh, in such an opulent house in the center of, a, of a, an important city like Vienna? Um, house Gustav Mahler. Now, the Stadtbahn Viennois, meaning the Viennese uh, subway system, uh, and uh, he worked extensively here. Many subway stations are by him. So wh whoever visits uh, and whenever, uh, whoever visits Vienna, uh, it's impossible not to come across some, uh, some of them because they are everywhere. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is uh, his contribution uh, to, to, to the city, at, you know, at a large scale. And uh, they function, they function well. Now, this one uh, is a famous one, in Karlsplatz uh, is, uh, um, you know, again, you know, without ornaments, the building would be uh, less uh, seductive. 
And uh, this is one of the most prestigious, but the one that I like the most is the one that he designed for the emperor and will arrive at it soon. This one, the Imperial Court Pavilion, meaning the, at, at the Hitzing Station, which is on the next stop on the tram from Schönbrunn Palace. And uh, so I'll just, if you allow me to read quickly uh, about this activity of Otto Wagner, construction of the Stadtbahn, which means the subway system, a metropolitan railway for Vienna was the biggest infrastructure engineering project in the city around 1900. So the pioneering modern architect of his day was commissioned to design the new metro lines and station buildings, which remain a striking feature of Vienna's cityscape to this day. It was on Wagner's initiative that the pavilion was specially built for Emperor Franz Joseph and his innermost circle of family and courtier at Hitzing Station. Designed in unique modern style and completed with opulent Art Nouveau interior decoration, in 1899 the building was to serve all the needs of the emperor and his entourage. That Franz Joseph actually used the pavilion only twice for a trip on the Stadtbahn was of secondary importance to Otto Wagner. His main concern was that the imperial splendor, which the Supreme Court cast over the little building, should bring a breakthrough for modern architecture. After extensive renovation and restoration works, the court pavilion has now been re reopened to visitors. It is a potent embodiment of Otto Wagner's artistic vision, which was to inspire the development of 20th century architecture. Now, I wouldn't, you know, from the standards of today, you wouldn't easily call it so very modern. But for that time, you know, at the end of the 19th century, it was. And it is a, it is a remarkable little building. It's not big, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's very well done. And yes, of course, uh, you know, it was built for an emperor. Only the train bringing the emperor would stop here. Uh, it helps sometimes now to work for an emperor. Uh, you, you can do things that uh, otherwise, uh, you know, they wouldn't be so easily done. But how to do it without irritating, you know, a certain sense of democracy? Because I repeat, uh, the pupils of Otto Wagner and even himself, he built, you saw, you saw many blocks of flats. Uh, and, and his pupils worked for, um, you know, the underprivileged, for, uh, you know, many, many and uh, large uh, um, housing complexes for, uh, you know, social housing, in essence. So I, I, I like this fact, you know, you had the emperor coming with a train here, but at the same time, you know, the students and pupils and even Wagner himself also looked left words and try to serve uh, those who were, uh, in a way, on the other side of the social spectrum. Very nice. Conjunctio oppositorum, uniting the opposites. The center, but also the periphery, and taking care of both with equal care. Even if the ex architectural expression was maybe different, but if you compare the um, uh, Karl Marx Hof uh, in, uh, in Vienna, there, there is a different kind of uh, architectural force as opposed to this little individualistic building for the emperor. And of course, you know, designs, uh, you know, rugs and uh, ornaments on the doors, on the glass, on the ceiling. Uh, it was a rich world, you know, fin du siècle. Uh, it was the end of a world and the beginning of another world. Now, this is a famous uh, apartment building uh, in Vienna, uh, one of his most famous. Uh, uh, this one also adorned, as you can see, abundantly with floral uh, decorations and, uh, and you know, uh, sculptures. Uh, 
the Viennese have, a, a, I think, a natural uh, liking of, of, uh, of, uh, of ornaments. But, you know, in Vienna, Adolf Loos <laughs> expressed himself very differently. So I, I like these tensions, these contradictions built in in Vienna. And by the way, of Vienna, there is a great chance. In fact, yesterday she wrote to me, there is a Viennese architect, a lady who runs a business called Green Skills. And I invited her to make a presentation here on Zoom about his, uh, her, um, you know, uh, activity running this, uh, you know, these workshops and they build things. And she agreed. So hopefully, uh, very soon we'll have a nice presentation from uh, an interesting uh, lady architect, uh, Constan Constance uh, Weiser, uh, if I pronounce well her name, uh, who studied at the um, uh, Academy, uh, the, um, uh, the Angevante, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, a very famous school. So hopefully, she will make a nice presentation about. Uh, building a lot, I mean, building with very little, you know, uh, uh, green skills. And I think for our time, something like this is, uh, is uh, almost mandatory, really. Anyway, um, I'll announce you in case uh, this will happen soon, and I hope it will. I think it is beautiful when people connect, you know, beyond frontiers and beyond time. And, you know, like when we had here, uh, you know, Bruce Danzinger uh, getting up at 8 a.m. in Los Angeles to be present here on Zoom when for us was 6 p.m. Or uh, someone from Singapore like yesterday or someone, uh, you know, like Vatsal from Ahmedabad and is later now in Ahmedabad. And so this shows that <clears throat> human dialogue is uh, <clears throat> is important and you know, it, it, it only unites us. He, he actually designed two buildings here, Otto Wagner. Is this one on the left, very, you know, painted, and, and the one to the right. Uh, uh, this one is a little bit more famous for some reason, but he designed both. You'll see, you'll see the other one as well. So these two, the one on the left and the one on the right, both were designed by uh, Otto Wagner. And I think in this presentation, you'll also see the, 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 the revolt of the sun, if I can say so, a Spanish uh, architect who works and lives in Vienna, quite a talented uh, uh, young architect who also studied postgraduate studies in, uh, in Vienna. And he destroyed the second building, the one on the right by Otto Wagner, in a very fluid and crazy building that he proposed. You'll see it. But sometimes, as I said, you know, the um, revolt against the father is a form of flattery, almost, sometimes. Anyway, uh, we'll arrive at his uh, unusual work. For the moment, we are with Wagner. And now is the, the, the building on the right, La Maison Medaillon, uh, the building with uh, medals. Uh, and you see the medals. So both these buildings, the one in the corner and the one on the left, were designed by Otto Wagner. And uh, you see the medals. And yes, they, uh, they add the richness of the building. Let us confess, you know, without them, uh, the building would be poor. And I actually think, you know, employing your talent to design ornaments or ornamental, uh, you know, uh, elements uh, for a building is a very pleasant activity. I'm sure there is here also a certain symbolism, there are allegories, I do not know them, but I don't think they are, you know, just uh, just forms, just shapes, or just colors. No. They 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 must have a certain, uh, you know, uh, metaphorical meaning.
So both both these buildings are uh, were designed by Otto Wagner. Now this is the project I was telling you about uh, by Gonzalo Vallo, and uh, he, uh, in fact, the students I went with uh, to Vienna last year uh, had the chance to meet him. Uh, he did this. Uh, I, I I launched a call a call for entries called uh, for tattooing Vienna. So the way he responded was by destroying the second building, the one with medals by uh, Otto Wagner. Of course, uh, those with uh, problems with the heart might uh, might uh, have a little bit of uh, trembling, but um, you'll see. This is what he did. So the, the first building uh, that you saw is this one by Wagner, but the second one was ruined by Gonzalo Vallo working with Maya. This is the plan of his intervention, is a tornado, is a, is a, is a turbulence, and uh, it expresses, uh, in a way, um, the anxiety of today. Well, he did it one or two years ago, but, uh, you know, uh, not too far away from now. You would say, why, why would he do this? Well, why was there deconstruction in the world? And... Uh, it's, it's maybe he was uh, sick and tired of the preeminence uh, or hyper eminence of, of, uh, of the father figure, meaning Otto Wagner, and at least at the level of, uh, you know, speculative design, why not? I mean, it, it, it is not going to be built uh, or unbuilt, but, uh, you know, this says something about the age we live in. You, you could maybe call this the rewilding of, of, of architecture, if there is such a thing. Architecture was against wildness, against nature. But this is the revenge of a wild nature on architecture, on building, on even on civilization. Now we arrive at a very important work by Otto Wagner. One of his most important is the Postal Office. It's a large building and I had been here with a number of students um, from Bucharest uh, and from other places. Um, it's one of his most important buildings and the interior appears in most histories of modern architecture. This one is a glorious uh, um, you know, uh, central space very well designed, very luminous, industrial looking, but also because of the warmth of the wood. Uh, uh, it, it's a mixture, you know, it, it's a public building. It's, it's, and there is also metal uh, and, uh, you know, the students loved, loved it. And behind, uh, you know, on the left side, there is, a, you know, some kind of a museum. And so it is a very celebrated building by Otto Wagner. And look at these columns, you know, um, I hope I have other images with them. Um, and outside, of course, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, goddesses, uh, you know, I don't know, protecting the building or uh, we miss, I personally miss such things in, in today's architecture. It's a huge office building. I mean, it's almost like the mother of office buildings, of, of offices, uh, of postal offices or uh, the father, if I can say so, it's, it's, it's huge. Now, relating, well, relating to this building, because across the street from this building, a little bit obliquely, but you can see both works from, I mean, you know, you can see the other building from, from the first one and vice versa, is this famous penthouse by Kopp Himmelblau, which is hard to see from, from the level of the, um, you know, the sidewalk. But I thought of showing it to you because it is, you know, really uh, across the street from uh, 
uh, a little bit obliquely from the postal office by uh, uh, Otto Wagner and also connects with what uh, uh, the Spanish uh, architect did. So this was the sketch for this penthouse. This was the first building built by um, Kopp Himmelblau, uh, uh, meaning Paul Frix uh, uh, and his partner. Uh, and um, it's like a spider on, on top of a, a terrace of an old building. Uh, this is the building. And, uh, you know, it was considered uh, by some uh, the first deconstructivist building ever built. And re literally, the, the postal office by uh, Otto Wagner is a little bit to the left uh, across the street. I mean, I'm curious what uh, Otto Wagner would have thought of this, uh, you know, addition or rooftop uh, addition by uh, by uh, by uh, Kopp Himmelblau. The world has changed, no? Okay, so we saw this one. So th we know now that the near the post office is also the penthouse by Kopp Himmelblau. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but you can, st if you know it is there, you'll see it from the street. And now we arrive at a beautiful church by Otto Wagner, uh, where he collaborated with a great artist also present in the, he was a founder of the secessionist movement, Coloman Moser. And, uh, and uh, Otto Wagner built the building, and it is, a, it is a, an impressive building. And Coloman Moser did the, you know, the stained glass windows and some other decorations. This was done by Coloman Moser. Uh, uh, both Wagner and Moser, Coloman Moser, were present in the group of artists and architects uh, uh, under the, the, the flag of uh, secessionism. Although, as I said, Otto Wagner came a little bit later after the founding of the movement. But then he became a serious uh, presence, uh, an important presence in the secession, secessionist movement. So this was done by Coloman Moser. Ah, my heart is, is happy, you know, because I don't know how to evoke to you the emotion I have because it's about greatness, it's about uh, you know the joy of creation, it's about collaboration between painter and architect and sculptor, and it's all for the glory of life. And 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 uh, we need that idealism again badly. We need to hold hands and collaborate and do creative works and believe in beauty and believe in, in creativity and. Uh, we need that. We need that badly, I think. Um, so yes, there, there, there was greatness here, no doubt. A group of artists and architects and uh, so on. They 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 were animated by 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 uh, uh, shared uh, ideals. It's a creative church. Is is. Uh, you know, it's not uh, repeating uh, dogma dictated by I don't know whom. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think God smiles at such creations because if man was made, uh, you know, uh, based on the appearance of God, uh, then, then, then if, and, and if God was and is creative, then, then the, create, the creature could also be creative. And I think the only... The best way to uh, to worship or to to you know to to pay homage or to show affection or to show your faith is being creative. And when you are not creative, you are be betraying the creator. Uh, for me, the, uh, this is almost a conviction. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, when I visited it, I couldn't get in. It's closed between certain hours and. I was not lucky, and it's hard to arrive at it because it's on top of a hill. Uh, <laughs> you need good legs and the good health to arrive there, but it's possible and it's worthy. And look at, look at this. You know, we need beauty. I think we need beauty, and we need even, I think, uh, faith. We need, uh, like here, you know, we have an angel that is uh, realized artistically impeccably, and. Uh, 
I don't feel it's an arrogant uh, statue. You know, it's uh, yes, it's decorative. Uh, it's different from the the statues of Chartres Cathedral, for example. But uh, it does show a, a belief that I think many artists and architects do have. That uh, you know, you 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 cannot separate really uh, art from uh, some form of um, some form of worship. I would say even in an apartment building. Now, this is uh, another pavilion. I couldn't find pictures, uh, only a two or three, and it's not very clear to me what's going on here, uh, but it was designed by him and it, was, it became a restaurant. It was uh, a little bit uh, out of the hands of the city, so to speak. Now, the second uh, Wagner Villa, so he built two, you saw the first one which I said, I, it looked like it was influenced uh, by um, uh, Schinkel. Uh, this one is more uh, austere, more so-called modern. You know, Wagner himself evolved in the sense of simplifying his architecture uh, more and more. And um, so this was his, apparently he built this building for his wife, you know, that who was younger than him and uh, you know he imagined he would die younger so his wife would live here but she actually died before him and he lived here for a while and then he sold it and he moved into an apartment building and we'll see that building too we are approaching the end of this presentation uh, even the way he drew you know this is a rendering of the house is different from the renderings you remember with those very flowers and arabesques and so on the, the renderings of, of uh, earlier uh, of his earlier works were different from the renderings of, of now i wonder you know was it really a progress this uh, accelerated uh, modernization um, but who knows well, things could repeat themselves but even here, you see the entrance into the building is an event. And there is even here narration. At, at the top, above the, the, the entrance door, there is some kind of, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, again, you have some kind of a fighter with uh, some kind of a mythological animal. And uh, I'm sure there is an allegory there and the symbolism that I, 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 I do not know, but Maybe it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not impossible to, to discover it. So even if his uh, architectural language became uh, more austere or more modern and more simplified, certain elements didn't vanish. Now, this was the first house. You see the difference, the first Wagner house and the second Wagner house. So now we see uh, we are approaching the end of the presentation. The last, I think these are the last two works that I showed. Two apartment buildings were erected on, or erected on two adjacent parcels. They clearly show Otto Wagner's interpretation of the urban apartment building in their simplicity the buildings reflect socio-economic conditions. In the Döblergasse building was the last city apartment of Otto Wagner. He lived from 1911 to 1918 there when he died. He died in 1918, as well as his last studio. This building housed the Otto Wagner archive from 1985 to 2003. We'll first see the, the, the other building and then we'll see, we'll end our, our journey through his work with a building he lived in uh, until he died. Uh, you, you already see, we are already so-called modern. Uh, or, you know, there is very little ornamental work. And if it is, it's of a very geometrical uh, nature. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, he moved on with, with the times. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's designed very well, very convincingly, and you can tell this is a, this is a master architect. Even in works that are, uh, you know, uh, 
simplified compared to his earlier works. And this is the building uh, where he spent the last years of his life and where his studio was. So it's a long distance now from that uh, subway station designed for the emperor, for Franz Joseph and, and this building. But this is the man who made the transition from, uh, you know, the turn of the century and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the empire aesthetics to modernity and, and he was continuously, uh, you know, on, on, on the front line of, of, uh, of uh, you know, art and architecture. And this is what a, 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 a creator is supposed to do to be in the front line and to open new vistas and new horizons. And yes, in the process, you also make mistakes, but uh, it's okay. Your life has to march on. So you see, he lived in this building from 1912 to 1918. And uh, the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art, I didn't know that there was such an institution, but there, were, there is, and is housed in this apartment building, uh, uh, this last one that I showed. Interesting institution the Viennese uh, Academy of Visionary Art. Uh, it's behind those doors. Nice. And Nick, you know, by contrast, look how it was, look how he built at the beginning of his career. You know, it, it, it's a big change, no? Uh, this was, uh, this was, uh, you know, the second half of the 19th century. And uh, this is a close, close to the second half of the of the 20th century not yet of course but um, anyway um, and we end with a with a with a glorious building by uh, uh, Josef Maria Olbrich and uh, the beautiful uh, uh, message uh, inscribed on uh, on the building that Zeit, forgive my German. I, I used to know German, but uh, that I was less than seven years old uh, because I went to a German kindergarten, but I'll try to read it in German because that's how it was written. That Zeit, ich Kunst, der Kunst, ich re Freiheit. Uh, to every age, it's art, and to art, it's freedom. Thank you very much. If you are still here, some of you, uh, I have to. Thank you for the presentation. You are welcome, Andre. Um, so we did it. We celebrated Olbrich. We celebrated uh, even Josef Hoffman and Otto Wagner. And uh, tomorrow it will be the turn of, uh, of uh, a remarkable uh, woman architect and designer architect, Eileen Gray. So, we continue. Do you want to say anything? I wonder if there are some uh, influences from Peter Behrens in, uh, in their works. Uh, and I uh, think of those black and white uh, drawings, uh, decorative drawings in the floor, in the in the walls. Um, the fact.